Welcome to the RightsCon studio. I'm Melissa Chan, and we'll be in conversation the next 30 minutes with Tawana Petty. Now, Tawana Petty is a social justice organizer involved in water rights, advocacy, data and digital privacy education, and racial justice and equity work. Kari Johnson is a senior writer for Wired covering artificial intelligence, and they'll be discussing the disproportionate impacts of algorithmic discrimination, predictive policing, and biometric surveillance on black communities. Tawana and Kari, over to you. Tawana and Kari, if you can hear me, over to you. Thank you. Hey, Tawana, how you doing? I'm doing good, Kari. Good to be in conversation with you. Likewise, um, it's been, um, it's always uh, a joy for me to connect with you. Um, you know, I think I first came to hear your uh, voice quite often in uh, Detroit Board of Police Commissioner transcripts and, and uh, <laughs> meetings and, I know that you did some work around um, training um, state appellate defenders in Michigan on, on use of facial recognition and, and other things. But I mean, if we could just start, you know, can you tell me a little bit about how you developed a concern with surveillance technology and how that became a part of your life? Yeah, so growing up in a city like Detroit, which uh, my entire life has been predominantly black, uh, as a child, uh, being in Detroit has been 96% uh, predominantly Black city, and now it's somewhere hovering under 80%. Uh, there's always been a pervasive, dominant, negative narrative, right? I've always felt like the eye of the world has been on Detroit. In some way, we've always felt like we're under some level of surveillance. But um, as I got into my adulthood and started to really dig into uh, what narrative mean and what uh, that impact had on policy and decisions in the city, I started to get into like media justice work. And through that work, like getting connected with folks like the Allied Media Projects, um, and then later in my uh, trajectory, uh, our data bodies and Detroit Community Technology Projects, which then led me to uh, Data for Black Lives. And then now where I am, the Algorithmic Justice League, um, I'm able to dig deeper into that type of work, but I get, I became connected with the algorith Algorithmic Justice League work um, accidentally. Uh, Detroit started to uh, use uh, face recognition uh, technology for face surveillance um, on our community through uh, Project Greenlight Mass Surveillance Program. And this happened at a time where I was doing research with our data bodies project. And I was learning from the communities across Detroit, Charlotte, um, and LA that they were feeling like they were being watched, but they weren't being seen. Um, that they felt like their, their data was being extracted uh, for uh, targeting and tracing and tracking them, but not for their benefit. And so this was happening contemporaneously with our uh, police department saying that they were launching this technology for the benefit of our safety. And so I started to see this conflation between surveillance and safety um, that was really confusing me. I, you know, I'm listening to community members say, I don't feel safe. I feel like I'm being watched. I'm not feeling seen. Um, I'm feeling tracked uh, I'm, and, and I'm feeling like I'm coerced into these sort of systems uh, that are targeting me. And so uh, I met, actually met Dr. Bulamwini um, as a poet, um, uh, I believe it was at the Data for Black Lives conference, uh, ironically, um, and uh, I, uh, she was uh, sharing with me her poem, AI Ain't I a Woman, and I was just blown away by that artistic contribution. And I was following her work from a distance and really uh, was blown away by um, by her artistic endeavors and then her research and started to leverage what I was learning through her research on the ground in my community. And so I'm like, this brilliant research through um, the Algorithmic Justice League, as well as Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology and others, uh, was helping me as a community member on the ground have an argument and a defense against leveraging things like face recognition uh, technology and face surveillance um, 
um, on our communities as a means for safety. And so I just kind of dug in deep and uh, continued in that trajectory. Um, the more I learned, the more I wanted to be involved. Yeah. And of course, that research having to do with uh, um, uh, that facial recognition systems can be biased towards people of color and that there were some instances of that, of course, that were found at false arrests that took place in Detroit around the time when that, that policy was being formed around uh, for police use of the technology, you know. Um, I, mean, I, was, I was wondering, uh, so this week, uh, something that's been in the news, um, I wrote about it as a, a bit myself as well, was uh, the idea of uh, taser drones uh, as a solution to uh, mass shootings. Um, putting those two words together, I'm a little upset that somebody made me do that. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm curious, um, do you have any thoughts on how that could go wrong? And <laughs> what's so <laughs> Yeah, and what sort of emotions? Uh, what sort of emotions do you feel play a role in the adoption of surveillance technology? Can play a role. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't have any thoughts on how it could go right. Uh, if that's helpful, um, just I mean, you know, I live in a city where on any given day I could see a drone outside my window, right? Um, and it, there were so many times when community members were saying. I believe I'm seeing police drones. I believe I'm seeing, you know, some sort of militarized un, unmanned vehicle flying around in the sky. And, and we were being denied that reality until we were able to prove it. Right. Um, and so now to fast forward and see um, our, our greatest fears, you know, mass shootings, uh, uh, increases in crime and other things being reacted to with things like uh, drones, um, that are able to uh, uh, have assault weapons and other things attached to them um, be a response to the anxieties that we already have um, in our most vulnerable state is just, it, it's, it's frightening and harmful. And it lets me know that our, our city governments um, have not given the thought and the time um, to really hear us as community members about what it means to be human. And so, and, and, it, and it also lets me know that we're ignoring um, the, the, ba the basic core um, uh, opportunities that we have to listen to our young people, especially, right? I, I doubt very seriously if, you're, if you listen to the children who have been most impacted by uh, a lot of the tragedies that are happening in our communities that you will hear, you know what I'd love to see? A drone in my community uh, solving the crisis that we're experiencing. And so it, it really does baffle me that um, our anxieties and our fears and our frustrations and, and the disparities that, um, that we're experiencing in our communities, uh, whether they are in school shootings or in urban communities that are uh, experiencing uh, fratricide where you know, uh, there, there aren't enough resources and so there's intercommunal violence um, that we're not reacting to that with uh, resources, um, more affordable water and affordable housing, um, and food and job training and things like that. And we're responding to them with uh, drones and mass surveillance and, and more uh, militarized policing. And so um, fear has been a driving factor um, in a lot of the decisions. And it, it, it is really um, that knee jerk reaction that has prohibited us from really asking the questions about what it really means to be human and what types of investments come from that type of conversation. And I don't think we're asking deep enough questions or having a slow enough conversation about the types of technologies, human technologies that we could invest in um, if we were really thinking deeply about our humanity. Hmm. You were talking uh, you know, a little bit about um, how the Algorithm of Justice League wants to um, build a global standard for uh, getting rid of um, facial data, um, uh, like, like face purge. Um, what's that? And how do you, how do you hope to accomplish that? I mean, we'd love to see a global face purge. I mean, look, you could look to places like Australia, Italy, France, the UK, and look at some of the actions they've taken against Clearview AI as an example. Uh, not just massive fines, but, but demanding that uh, the community's data be purged 
from those systems. And we really believe that um, that the United States should be at the forefront of leading in that sort of trajectory, right? Should be demanding that our that our data, our faces, not be leveraged for the extraction for extraction um, and and a trade off for benefits and services, right? And so the vendors that are taking our faces and making uh, that exchange for like our benefits, our, our medical and other services, that should not be a trade-off. And uh, some of the stuff that I learned through my research prior to coming to the Algorithmic Justice League is that is the way that community members are feeling, that there is this trade-off, that there's this data trail or this data stream of information that is being leveraged against them and not for their benefit. And so, you know, when your face is being extracted for that to your detriment, then it has this harmful trajectory that follows you throughout your life. And so uh, we shouldn't be, ID me is a perfect example of that. We shouldn't have to give our face in order to access our benefits with the IRS, right? Um, and so we'd love to see a global face purge. And I think you can look at places like Italy, Australia, the UK, France, and other places who are taking very strong stances with regard to the privacy of their uh, citizens and residents uh, with regard to that. I mean, you mentioned Clearview AI, and, you know, we know that they scraped a lot of their, um, the facial data that was used to, to train its um, algorithms. And I know that, you know, earlier this year, I think the FTC required Another another company to to get rid of uh, to destroy an algorithm that was considered gotten from like ill gotten data. Do you feel like companies that are building with like scraped uh, facial data should should be required to destroy those algorithms? Yeah, I mean, look at Facebook. <laughs> You know, uh, sometimes even when the data is deleted or even when they're fined, like Facebook to the tune of like 500 and uh, I think it was $50 million, I think that they should be prevent, they should have to, to scrape that data because it's subject to breaches. It's, it's, it's subject to um, security breaches. And so we're seeing our data, we're seeing that our data is unsafe, um, it, that is collected in these massive ways um, is unsafe, uh, it's being breached. Um, and we're at a time when ethics is still such a very new conversation within machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, and algorithmic decision making. And so we haven't had a deep enough conversation around, like we're still having a very robust debate around what's ethical. We're still having a very robust debate around bias. We're still having a very robust debate around harms and what that means. We're still having a very robust debate around which communities are, are marginalized uh, within the systems uh, with regard to machine learning. We're still having a very robust debate around who is most responsible, you know, the person, the people who are designing or the people who are implementing or who's most responsible, the folks who are, are who are deploying these technologies. And so I think we're we're at a we're actually at a prime opportunity where we can put pause, we can purge uh, and we can reevaluate. Uh, whether or not a lot of these systems should exist in the first place. And so, yeah, I think we need to purge. I think we need to scrape. I think we need reevaluation. And I think we need to be having much deeper questions about what should exist um, and, uh, and, and what we should get rid of. I should say that I think Facebook um, did uh, scale back some of its use of facial recognition last fall. But, um... but they have not committed to not using it under Meta. Yeah. Um... We've got about two minutes left before we get into the questions, um, but I wanted to bring it back around to, um, I guess a simpler, well, I guess it's not simple. I don't know, you tell me. None of it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> um, what gives you hope? Oh, what gives me hope? Young people. Young people give me hope. You know, uh, I want to lift up. There was a young person named Aurora. Um, I forget. I think she was ten, and mm -hmm. she she dressed up like Dr. Bolamwini, um for her school presentation, uh, and she had her shield for the Algorithmic Justice League, and she brought her laptop, um, and she came to our coded bias screening, and 
Um, and she was just, she was prepared with questions and, um, and like, you know, she's like the face of data justice and, and algorithmic justice. And, um, and so that gives me hope, right? There are so many young people out here doing climate justice work. There are so many people out here saying that, you know, we want, we want gun legislation that is not just talk. Right. Um, there's so many young people out here talking about what it means to truly um, make sure that everyone has affordable housing and water, you know. Um, and so and they're not taking the mess that a, a lot of our generations have dealt with. Now, this is not to to minimize the, the legacies and, and generations of work that has come before us. But if you look at back at history, it's always been the young people. It's always been the young people generationally. And sometimes when we get older, we forget that we were young when we started doing that advocacy work. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 the young people give me hope every single day. Um, but they're also the same people that keep me, um, keep me, you know, angered um, because, because uh, the world tends to remind me of how little we take care of them. Mm. Yeah. Um, to go to some of the questions from the audience, um, the first one here is, uh, how can we raise awareness about these issues where militarized mass surveillance is normalized and goes mostly unquestioned within communities? Yeah, I, I have a, I have a friend who always says it is better to be an inch wide and a mile deep than a mile wide and an inch deep. And so basically that means talk to your neighbor, talk to your relatives, talk to the people in your home. And it's like the mycelium under the earth, right? It's like if you get that five, five core people and you have these consistent conversations and then they talk to five more people, that is how you get rooted and deep. And you have these conversations that then spread through your community. It doesn't always have to be about mass mobilization because mass mobilization is how you get the message far and wide immediately, but it's not how you get the message to stick. And so we have to have those slower, more consistent, more deeply rooted, longer conversations and, and they have to be within more rooted in our communities and so yeah that that is how I approach the work yes yes it's important to get things to go viral um, and, and to get things to be out there on a larger scale but really it's those conversations those deeper conversations that we have in the smaller uh, uh, trajectory of our lives that are are most important mm. um, and another one here uh... How do we balance the need for ethical standards and more discourse with the speed and constant rollout of new technologies? That's a good one. Oh, <laughs> that is a good one. As someone who served as an ethics reviewer, <laughs> um, I, I will tell you that is a that is a consistent ongoing debate. And one of one of the things that I'm always um, saying to folks that I'm in conversation with when they ask me this is have a conversation with yourself about being on the opposite end of the thing that you're developing um, and the technology that you are um, uh, designing for, uh, the formula that you're creating. Or if you're not the one creating the, the folks that you're in conversation with that are designing for this technology. Because the, the thing that I'm always told is that we don't get an opportunity to think about this when we're in the lab or when we're doing the work. But you have to make an opportunity to think about this. It's almost like breathing deeply, right? I've had a lot of health challenges recently. And I remember I told my doctor, um, you know, I just realized that I don't, I don't deep breathe a lot. And she said, well, if you want to live, you will. Um, and it's really, the, it's, it's that basic, right? If you want to live, you will take the moment to deep breathe. And that's what we have to do with, the, with algorithmic decision-making, with machine learning and artificial intelligence. We have to make the time to deep breathe because we're at a moment where we're, we're losing the opportunities that we have to ask those deeper questions. And, um, and, and now we're seeing money on a level that we've never seen before be invested in these technologies, be invested in law enforcement um, to a degree that it hasn't been before. Um, and, and we're losing that window to have those moments where we ask, is this necessary? Should this exist in the world? And so um, I think we have to make the time and we have to ask the tough questions. Um, and I, I love to see organizations like DARE 
um, with Tim Nick Gebru that is really saying like, you know, I, I'm going to ask those questions right now. I'm going to say, you know, is this necessary? Um, and, and I think uh, we have more and more people popping up into the world that are saying that. Um, and so we'll make it happen. Okay. Do you feel like any of the surveillance technology review policies that cities have put in place have been helpful in that, giving people a chance to ask questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, person from a personal standpoint, of course, I'm in love with the bands, <laughs> um, um, especially around face surveillance, right? From the algorithmic justice league's perspective, of course, we we do not we do not support face surveillance. We're not uniformly uniformly saying that uh, all um, forms of um, of uh, face recognition. We're you know we're not blanketly saying that, but face surveillance, no. Um, but I will say this: um, uh, the conversations around even moratoriums, or even in Detroit, where we were not successful with a ban where there's a policy in place that now has penalties for misuse. There's a policy in place there where, you know, if civil liberties are being violated, um, gives an opportunity for that conversation between community and law enforcement to have, you know, uh, that those questions, right? When a case goes to the prosecutor's office, the prosecutor is now pushing it back if they don't have enough evidence. Um, and, you know, it is not far enough but it is a question that was not happening before. Um, at a point before I became in touch with uh, the Algorithmic Justice League's research, um, they were doing real-time tracking surveillance of Detroit residents. Without our pushback, um, that's what would have happened. A law enforcement officer would have been able to use a cell phone and target and track any resident in the city of Detroit or any person who visited the city of Detroit. Um, in real time. Well, now they can no longer do that because of that pushback and that policy. And so it offered up an opportunity, although it is not an outright ban, it offered up an opportunity to make that distinction between what real-time tracking surveillance is and what um, someone uh, accused or convicted of a, you know, uh, what is considered a heinous crime uh, where this technology would be leveraged. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, it offers up those opportunities for that debate. I think the debate should be never, never ending, um, as long as these technologies exist, uh, whether you're on the side in favor of it or against it. Yeah. And we've got time here, I think, for one last question from the audience, which is, um, what are some methods that you've used to prove that mass surveillance was going on in, in the communities that you've worked in, especially? when you have no data from government or tech companies? Yeah, some of the methods that folks have used are definitely videoing when you see something flying outside your, <laughs> out your apartment window. Um, documentation is paramount. Um, um, uh, consistent, uh, as Kari said, consistent representation at our board of police commissioners meetings, uh, the civilian oversight body, uh, um, consistently making your voice heard because a lot of times there's a lot of gaslighting that happens when when uh, policymakers and uh, other agencies want to invest in a technology that is not popular. Um, they have a lot of resources to have the narrative that they want. And so it takes a lot of public pressure um, to ensure that your narrative of things uh, is uh, uh, prevails. And so you have to ensure that you are consistently documenting, um, whether that is video, photography, um, or just showing up at your city government meetings. Um, uh, and then bringing in other folks, we brought in AI ethicists, we brought in um, uh, machine learning experts. Uh, we brought in research from the Algorithmic Justice League. We brought in research from Georgetown Center for Privacy and Technology. We brought in folks who were doing that work um, and had the evidence that we needed to back up our, um, you know, what was considered an assumption before um, we could back it up with the research. And so everything is important. It all has to work together. Um, and then we were eventually able to collaborate with city government officials who were then able to be educated and uh, lean into our side of things based on the knowledge that they now were able to gain from that information, so. Yeah. Um, 
one last question. <laughs> um, and, and this is just, to, I guess, to get to the particulars of it, but I, I guess what kind of mechanisms does AJL use in its advocacy work or, you know, in outreach? Yes, please go to AJL.org. Our library is extensive. You want to definitely join our um, uh, Dump ID Me campaign. Um, our, our YouTube channel has a lot of resources as well. Um, you want to do the Dr. Joy show, uh, watch that and share that. Um, if there is an algorithmic harm that you have experienced, you want to report that. And there's just so many uh, resources that uh, AJL has to offer. Um, and uh, if you want to take our drag uh, versus AI workshop, you can participate in that. And so, yeah, we're out here doing the best that we can to ensure that the voices of those who are most impacted are lifted up within this fight for algorithmic justice. Okay. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Tawana. Thanks for Always your good to be in conversation with you. Likewise. And that's it for now from the RightsCon studio. As always, check us out on Twitter to get the latest. And of course, stay engaged. <laughs>